No, it didn't seem crazy to make it into a series to me. These days, not much seems crazy to me. I mean, you have shows that start out with the last episode, or they have flashbacks throughout them, or lead characters get killed instantly. You know, there's just so much freedom in television. I'll put it this way. If the Coen brothers had been opposed to it, I probably wouldn't have done it. But the fact that I knew they were for it, I, I said, yeah, that's, I see nothing wrong with it whatsoever. The Coen Brothers film came out in 1996, multiple Academy Award winning. Um, and in 97, I was at NBC, and Bruce Paltrow and Robert Palm came in and said, let's do Fargo the series. I love the film. And I was intrigued by that notion. And they were high quality auspices, so I said yes. A little gift that they gave me at the time was a snow globe that had a car flipped over and Marge was kind of bent over and following the blood leading to a dead body. It was a wonderful snow globe, I loved it, and I kept that close to me for many years. Well, I developed that script. Um, at the end of the day, I didn't make it. I didn't go to pilot because I, I was worried about disappointing the audience. I thought it was a network television adaptation of a brilliant, iconic film. A year later, they did a pilot. Kathy Bates directed, and Edie Falco starred as Marge. Um, and it was a busted pilot that never went anywhere. I've never seen that. About three and a half years ago, I was staring at that snow globe, and it just hit me, and I went, it's time. Television's changed. Maybe we could do Fargo the right way and not disappoint anyone. We pitched it to FX. They were really, really excited with the original vision that Noah brought to it. Well, when they first said, we want you to adapt Fargo, but do you think you could do it without Marge, by which they meant any character? in the movie, by which they meant, can you write us a Coen Brothers movie? I guess the first real scene or moment that I thought of was two men in the emergency room, and one of them was a very civilized man, and the other was a very uncivilized man. And the question was, who were those men, and why were they there, and what did that collision really lead to? What happened to your nose? Oh, it's, uh, it's just a misunderstanding. Now, was this you misunderstanding the other fella, or him misunderstanding you? Pardon? There's a moment where Malvo says to Lester, you know, your problem is you think there are rules. There are no rules. And I always saw it as an infection, that Malvo infects Lester in some way from that first meeting that will then carry its way through the remainder of the 10 hours. If you don't stand up to it, let them know you're still an ape. Oh, you're just going to get washed away. Well, no one wants to be the guy who ruined the Coen brothers, you know? The bar is definitely high. But, you know, it was a really interesting process to then go and re-examine the movie and really the whole body of work. You're making a mistake. And think about what made that movie that movie and what makes a Coen Brothers movie a Coen Brothers movie. Not so we could imitate it, but just to understand the dynamics. They're up there in that upper echelon of filmmakers that sort of everything they do has a very specific tone, very specific look. Realty. Their films are almost like records. You, you have to be in the right mood for it. That makes sense. And if you're not in the right mood, then you're not going to understand what it is that they're doing or what it is that they're saying. But if you catch that movie at the right time, or vice versa, the movie catches you at the right time, actually, I should say. I changed my mind. It's some really rich storytelling. I'm not surprising anyone when I say that those guys are very private and they exist in a kind of bubble. I had waffles with them in New York. I mean, what else would you eat with those guys, I guess? You know, they had a caveat in their contract which said, we're gonna read a script. If we like the script, we'll put our names on the show, and if we don't, you're on your own. They got it, you know, and I think they appreciated. I wasn't doing a Coen Brothers imitation. There was something else going on that felt like their work, but was not about copying them. And then that was it. They never engaged on the scripts again. You know, they watched the first cut, and Ethan said, uh, yeah, good. And that was the sum total of his critique, so. Which I hear is a rave, so. I think I thought what a lot of people thought when they first heard, which is like, why, are you, why, why would you do that? 
Yeah, my initial reaction was the same as anyone's. Don't wreck the movie. You know, I do a show called Sherlock, and I had the same kind of thing about, well, does, you know, well, modern shit, do we need that at the moment? You know, and you only really know when you read the script and the first three pages tell you whether you want to do it or not. Some artists were intimidated to go into a Cohen world. And so it was critical for us to find that first piece of casting, the right piece of casting. And once we had Billy Bob Thornton, he has the Cohen brothers' credibility, their credentials. It said to the community, don't be afraid of Fargo. Embrace it. I need a room. Just you. What difference does that make? It's a different rate for two. And if you got cats, dog, cat, it's an extra 10 bucks. What if I got a fish? Would a fish cost me $10? I wasn't looking to get in a television series because I think of it as like six or seven years, possibly. You know what I mean? And I got a bunch of movies I still want to make. What if I had bacteria? Sir, bacteria are not pets. But it's 10 episodes, and Noah's writing was so good. He created his own animal also, you know? And I called up and said, why wouldn't you do this? I mean, it's terrific. Uh, sir, do you have a pet or not? No. It's just me. And we said, well, do you want to know everything that happens to your character? And he goes, no. I love this. I'm in. That opened a floodgate. Martin Freeman quickly jumped in. And Oliver Platt. Phone call, Chief. Bob Odenkirk. His wife. Key and Peele. Where's the midget? Everyone seems to want to play in the cable world. Watch your head. All right, thank you. Obviously, I'm on an FX show already. I know those guys over there, and I know the kind of shows they want to make, and I know that they want to push the boundaries. So I knew that they were taking a risk. You're taking a risk when you're taking an iconic film like this and trying to recreate what that film did so well. But there was always a lot to explore. So I don't know that it was necessarily something that had to be done, but it was certainly something that deserved to be done. Having worked with Joel and Ethan for so long and known them for so long, there's a certain sensibility that informs all their material, all their films. And when I sat down with Noah to discuss the you know, content and the creative aspects of Fargo the series, I immediately felt the same sense of deep knowledge of the world that he's trying to portray. So it was really exciting. I remember walking out of the meeting thinking, this is fantastic because there's a lot to be explored in that universe that Fargo created, so to speak. There's two kinds of policies you should be thinking about. Well, uh, at least let me give you a, a brochure. Or, or I got these uh, pen, I got these nif nifty pens. And at first approach, you go, oh, I see, Lester is Jerry. Okay, well, if, if Nothing could be further from the truth. Those thoughts of the previous incarnation, they kind of went into the background, because I thought this job on its own merit is worth doing. And I hope that people will be surprised by it. And as an audience member, I want to be surprised. I don't want to know in the first five frames who everybody is and all they will ever do and all they will ever be. I want to be surprised. And Lester certainly has the capacity for that. Mr. Nygaard? Yeah. Oh, hiya. Hi. Deputy Salverson again. I just have a few more questions. Is now a good time? I booked the show and thought, maybe I should watch the movie again. It's been years, and I thought, maybe not. Maybe that's the worst thing that you could do. So I waited about five or six weeks, I think, into filming to watch it again. I wanted to make sure I kind of had a handle on Molly before I took a look at Margie, so I didn't fall into any patterns of this other really strong performance. She's screaming to see who it is, and then right there, she realized you, <laughs> you again. But, you know, I think that the main difference between these two women that they very wisely have focused on is that Margie is the chief. You know, she's been doing this for a long time, and she's in charge and Molly is not in charge. Here's the thing. I took the photo, and I showed it to Lester. Gotta say, uh, I'm super ticked here. Yeah. That's such a defining part of her personality and her role, is that she is surrounded by fools in a lot of ways <laughs> and, and should be in charge, should very clearly, to both her and probably the audience, be the one who's in charge, but she's not. Because we have 10 episodes, right, naturally you just have to have more story. There's just more of an infrastructure you need to build and more characters are required. 
Roy Lester. The pilot is all about Lester and Malvo. We meet Gus at the very end, but then we start episode two with Wrench and Numbers, and we introduce Stavros Milos, the supermarket king. You know, the universe has to expand so that you can put all the moving pieces in place to build toward your end game. Oh, hello, you. You got bronzer on your blackmail note. You know, obviously the movie is a true story that wasn't true, and the show is definitely not true. I mean, none of the things, I mean, it's, I didn't go out and hunt down a true crime story and adapt it to my purposes. We just made it up. But I think what that disclaimer did on the movie that was so interesting was it allowed them to break the story in a non-traditional way. It allows me to introduce Gus Grimley on page 50 of the script, because that's the moment in real life when his character intersected with Malvo's character. We could do it that way. And it also allows me to do those truth is stranger than fiction moments and go, well, I'm just telling you how it happened. I'm not saying it makes sense. I'm just telling you how it happened. How much? Tell you what, you give me $55, I'll give you the socks and throw in this 12 gauge. And the best example of that is the Mike Yanagita character. You know, there's a moment in the movie where Marge gets a phone call out of the blue from this guy she went to high school with, and she ends up having lunch with him at the Radisson, and he tells her the story about this girl from high school that he married, and then she got leukemia and she died, and it's so tragic and he's so lonely, and then later she finds out that it's not true, that he made all that up and there's a restraining order against him. And you're like, why is this in the movie? And all these baby spiders popped out of his neck. It's so odd, it has to be true. Like they wouldn't have put it in the story unless it was a detail. It's very oddness adds to the truthiness of the movie. And so from my very first meeting with FX, I said, what is our Mike Yanagita? That is the question. I heard about what happened, the murders. But there are lots of little Easter eggs throughout the series that I would read a script and then read the script again and be like, oh my gosh, that's from the film. And I'm sure that for people who are like real Cohen buffs, there will be even more that I didn't even notice. Because I know that Colin noticed things that I didn't notice. And he'd tell me about it. I'd be like, oh, that's right. <laughs> Some of them are pretty literal. The white Russian, that's obviously a pretty big nod. But then there's also smaller ones, too. Missed a spot. You know, the shot of him lying in bed is a nod to a shot in No Country for Old Men. It's like we reference them. Nope. And then, of course, being a different story, a different landscape, a different set of characters, we did create our own feel. But part of maintaining the look of Fargo is always kind of staying in that Cohen world, the tone and the aesthetic. And for me, A Serious Man really had this oddness to it. And I loved that whole Goy's teeth parable. Definitely inspiration, obviously, we do a parable sequence in episode five. A rich man opens the paper one day. I is this a... Uh... It's a parable. It was one whole day devoted to shooting the parable sequence, and we actually had a different cinematographer for it just because we had to be shooting a main unit on the same day. And you go to a lot of trouble to do this stuff that doesn't necessarily move the plot forward, but if you can take a detour into a parable that's going to play thematically into your show, that's worth the time. There's a lot of parables, there's stories within stories, there are homages to literature and folk tales throughout, and uh, part of the fun of watching the series is trying to figure out what that all means. And I don't pretend to know. And then the fact that, oh my gosh, there's this little Easter egg of a link that takes us back to the original film, I thought was brilliant, and that brought it full circle for me. If it had just been a gimmick, I probably wouldn't have done it. But the fact that it came at this critical moment in Stavros's life when he's literally praying to God, and then God reveals the money to him, and he spends the money, and he doesn't devote himself to God's name, and then suddenly fish start falling from the sky, you know what I mean? What does it mean? I don't know. You tell me. You know, the original film was shot in Minnesota, in the Twin Cities area, a little bit in North Dakota, but not a lot. And uh, we're looking for the same type of environment with a guarantee of a lot of snow. Calgary gives us that in spades. 
We've got the mountains to the west, which Fargo doesn't need, but you go to the east and we have this very strong, iconic prairies where we've got a large grain belt, which is the same as Minnesota and North Dakota. We've got the cattle. We can represent exactly Fargo. We're making a movie. It has to be shot like a movie. And the Coens shoot on a very limited lens range, right? You're shooting between an 18 millimeter lens, which is a very wide angle lens, and really a 40 millimeter lens, which is a good close-up lens. The lens choices dictate everything. We definitely do our establishing shots higher. Like we, so if, if we do start with an establishing shot of a scene, it's gonna be 30 feet off the ground. Okay, it's gonna be on a lift. And the most shows don't do that. That's much more cinematic. It's much more singular camera. There's a discipline because of that singular camera that kind of naturally takes you to that Fargo look and that style. You know, Dana's job working with the new directors as they come in is to say, no, that's not an angle that we use. That's not a lens we use, you know. Here's the Coen Brothers shot, you know, and the directors, they've loved the challenge of it as well. That said, after we started shooting, I think the whole thing began to take on a little bit of a life of its own because you can't set up every shot worrying or wondering, like, what would they do? You know, you have the circumstances in front of you and you just try to do your best job with it. And in scenes, we're not afraid to just let the camera sit there. It takes a certain amount of patience, but the next thing you know, you're there. You somehow walk through the lens and you're in that world because it's not all cut up. As an actor, it's incredibly liberating because you're not going to lose anything. You feel like all of those little things, all of those moments where Gus is picking something out of his eye or Molly is tucking her hair, it's just all of these little things. It's always fun to put those things into a performance, but it's even more rewarding to see it actually survive. Hey, Mark. A lot of times you just shoot it because you have to make the day. You have X amount of scenes that you have to do, you have X amount of hours, and you just have to finish it. It's simple as that. Nice and quiet, let's get it before the planes come. Let's roll this. And action! I guess they call them blocks because we've been shooting two episodes at a time, block to block, but the first block was done by this team of director and cinematographer that were honestly the fastest people I've ever worked with in my entire life. And given the weather, that was incredibly advantageous. As one gets older, one starts to appreciate things like that, like how fast you go and how cold it is outside. And then the acting is secondary. The last day we shot was on this frozen lake, and I believe it was minus 27 Fahrenheit, which I think is, I don't know what that is, Celsius. And it was like being on Pluto or something. I had nothing really to relate it to. The props department had mocked up a dummy for us. But the tricky thing is that once the dummy had been dunked once, it became waterlogged. It became almost so heavy that the actors couldn't lift it anymore. And we barely got take two. The morning of that day, it was about 28 or 30 below zero. And it was so cold. Keith Carradine said he couldn't physically move his face. You know, uh, <laughs> I'd say if, if there's any secrets of staying warm in the cold, it's still go out. <laughs> and of course, probably all the locals are thinking, you wuss, this is meat and drink for us, this is nothing. But for me, I'm like, no, this is properly cold. Isn't it? Because we're all from here, six months of the year, it's cold, right? So all the film crew here are pretty aware of how to keep warm and how to be able to keep working through the cold weather. We just apply all that to the actors, too. So everybody's got long underwear and vests that have battery packs in them that sort of power up if it's really cold. And there's some things we can't do anything about, you know, but we do as much as we can. Working in the cold is pretty interesting. I did a movie in 97 called A Simple Plan in Wisconsin and Minnesota, which was colder than this. So I've been in worse. It can be challenging, but it's also good. It helps you as an actor, kind of amps you up, you know, and it sort of becomes part of the character. I think it's that way for all of us.
Well, very memorably, we had a day where the environmental conditions were such that we had to pull the plug on the day and we couldn't shoot. It was predicted to be 20 below zero. I was a little anxious because we had to have a guy jump out of a car in his underwear. <laughs> and there's a certain point where someone's not going to survive that. The original day we planned to do that, it turned out to be 40 degrees below zero, both centigrade and Fahrenheit. So we had to just say we can't shoot in that kind of weather, too cold. We came for the cold, but we mm, weren't really prepared for that. I don't think this story can be told in Los Angeles with a bunch of snowmaking machines. It just wouldn't be the same. People would be a little bit more comfortable, maybe. <laughs> you know, and it's like here, there's no comforts. We're on I Station Zebra. I mean, trucks are freezing. Sometimes I feel like we cheated death. And action, guys. You know, Noah's really particular about the squeak of the snow. If it's a deep snow, we want the right sound for a deep snow. If it's the light snow on the ground, he still wants to hear the crunch. And the Foley walkers work really hard. They've got different kinds of ice and different levels of shaved snow that they bring in to do all the walking and the footsteps. Just know that we've worked really hard to make sure that that blood looks right against the snow. You know, you can make it too pink, you can make it too dark. You know, everybody's got a different blood type. So, you know, we actually think about that stuff as we're color timing and blending everything together. The biggest challenge was to try to predict where Noah and John Ross were going to take the visual effects to. You had to dismiss geography, basically just cut for expression and predict points of view that would be basically like nothing. But at the same time, when you're looking for someone with a gun, you know, nothing can be pretty effective. Lots of gunfire, lots of squibs. Okay, let's roll sound, slow up. So I arrive on set, and there's not a cloud in the sky, and I'm sort of like, are you sure you want to shoot this? Should we wait? But they, you know, they just look at me like, we're not waiting for you. You know, we got actors. We got to get this thing going. So they're just rolling cameras. We had shots like this. We had direct sunlight, big, long shadows, and there's no fog. So. We went and did rotoscoping on uh, various layers. That allowed us to create this buildup. We can now adjust it. We can add more foreground snow. We could do whatever we want. So yeah, it was a massive challenge to get done. But thank goodness it came out awesome. Halt! <laughs> I am really sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah gathered from the volume of flowers. Too much? No. No, it's nice. It was fun to play at the beginning of these two people falling in love, just like the very, very beginning of it, and then skip past everything else to them already being, like, comfortable and, like, domesticated, you know? You miss out on all those mechanics of things, it's sort of like Greek tragedy where all of the, <laughs> all of the action happens off stage, you know? We had it on the writer's room board as OYL because people would walk in and we didn't want them to see that we were entertaining it. There was a writer who helped me break story named Steve Blackman who said, well, what if we jump forward a year? I was a little resistant to it at first because it felt like it might be gimmicky. While at the same time, I understood the appeal of it because if it is a true story, right, sometimes things go cold and then they come back for some reason. And when I woke up in the morning, I thought, well, she's pregnant. That's what you do. And now it is the movie, right? Now she's Marge. Honestly, Lester, stay or go, but I got a bladder the size of a penny, so. Oh, you oh, poor thing. thing. Please come in. Thank you. But it also serves as this palate cleansing moment of everything that these characters have gone through up until that point. It's sort of the reset button. You remember the red sauce? Oh, shoot. It causes you to have hallucinations. What? My favorite scene to play was the scene where she comes home from work and she gets into bed with him and they said, just really let it breathe, like don't feel the need to get it all out there, give it as much space as you want. And so the scene with like six lines, we, we did takes that took, you know, five minutes because we just sat in silence for so long together. So much of acting and television is standing where they need you to stand and saying something, you know. 
And even when you are doing like emotional scenes, you have to remember all these technical things. So to be able to play a scene where all I had to do was get into bed and all Colin had to do was roll over and we only had to remember seven words between us and then be able to just kind of like live in that moment was really special. We're doing good. You know, that moment of Molly and Gus in bed in the middle of episode eight was because I wanted it to feel like the end. I wanted it to feel like, okay, well, they didn't get Lester and she's just gonna have to live with that and now they're in bed and, oh, I thought there were two more episodes, but I guess this is it, I guess it's over. And then we drop down through the bed and suddenly we're in Vegas and then it all starts again, you know? Without further delay, I give you Lester Nygaard. Lester stops being the sort of harried wuss who's trying to get away with murder, and he starts to become something darker, and he realizes he's good at this, actually, and that he likes the feeling of power. And so at a certain moment, when Malvo comes back into his life, and any sane person would just run. Well, what are the odds? He says, I can take this guy. You know, it's, it's an incredible hubris on his part. No. Lester starts off as an acolyte to Malvo because Malvo's great joy in life, it seems like, is turning people to their darkness and watching them flounder in it. That's on you. But unexpectedly, I think Lester outduels and outsmarts the master who's Malvo. Shit, Lester. So that's a twist that I didn't see coming. People were saying, God, we were kind of rooting for you. I felt guilty about it, but I didn't want him to find you or get you or whatever. People end up rooting for me and Lester, you know? And usually, like, when you got people that turn that dark, you're not really rooting for them. How do we satisfy an audience? Satisfy them with a conclusion. And that's exactly what we do. Audiences who come to Fargo will see a beginning, middle, and end and that journey will be complete. Don't make them wait years for a conclusion. Just take them on an incredible character journey in a really unique place. Sioux Falls. Ever been? Went to Sioux City once, back in my scandalous days. About the fourth time they mentioned Sioux Falls, I was like, I hope they do a season about Sioux Falls. Because uh, I want to know what happened in Sioux Falls. What did happen in Sioux Falls? Will we ever know? It's a good question. And you know, if I make another Fargo, it would be a whole new story, but it would possibly be connected in some way to either the movie or the first season. Because I like that idea that in a larger sense, there's a history of fake true crime in Minnesota that's all connected in some way. And that at the time I'm done telling these stories, it's going to be a big landscape.